Welcome. Uh, the University of St. Louis in Brussels is extremely pleased to have you today, especially knowing that uh, in Belgium Friday afternoon has a strange status, and that it's a glorious day as well. Uh, this gathering, organized by the law school, is the second of its kind this year. In November, we had a presentation by Sir Michael Edwards, the first Englishman to be admitted to the prestigious Académie Française, and he spoke to us about Hassine and Shakespeare. Today's debate leaves the cobblestone streets of Stratford and Port Royal in the 17th century to embark on the subject of transnational judicial dialogue in the 21st. Both presentations are intended to celebrate this university's bilingual programs and both are intended to highlight the virtues and also the pitfalls that lie beneath any comparative undertaking. The English title for this series of conferences is Crossing Borders, and to be honest, I do prefer the French title, Le Passeur de Frontières. It has a more human, a more humane touch, and it captures the exhilaration and the sheer danger that the people involved in these meetings experience, like walking on a tightrope. We have two very prestigious speakers this afternoon. Lady Hale, Baroness Hale of Richmond, Deputy President of the UK Supreme Court, and Judge Paul Lemons of the European Court of Human Rights. Just a few words of presentation before coming to the debate itself. Lady Hale graduated from Cambridge taught law and practiced as a barrister. She specialized in family and social welfare law. In 1984, she was the first woman to be appointed to the Law Commission. After sitting as a High Court judge and then at the Court of Appeal, she became the first woman law lord. In October 2009, she became the first woman justice of the newly created Supreme Court. She was appointed Deputy President of the Supreme Court in June 2013, succeeding Lord Hope of Craighead. Judge Paul Lemon studied law at the University of Antwerp and at the University of Leuven. He obtained an additional master's degree in law at Northwestern University in Chicago. Besides serving as a counselor at the Belgian Council of State, he has consistently kept a foot in academia and is the founder of the Leuven Institute for Human Rights and Critical Studies. Since September 2012, he has been sitting as judge at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, succeeding François Stulkens. Now, uh, the format of this debate this afternoon will begin with a few questions for about 15 minutes, and then uh, you'll have the floor for questions and answers for about 20, 25 minutes. My first question is, is related to something that we can notice recently, we have uh, many articles that use the word dialogue, transnational, world community, comparative reasoning, communication, judicial networks, judicial globalization. And many of these articles pick up on a few decisions, often from the area of human rights adjudication, and on the basis of a few ornamental references to foreign cases contained in these decisions, uh, we conclude that high courts are increasingly talking to each other. And some announce that this phenomenon heralds the twilight of the end. Uh, of, it's, it, hi it highlights the, the twilight of the positivistic Kelsenian tradition and trumpets the birth of something new. Taken in the European context, different legal scholars speak about a new phenomenon of horizontal legal integration surfing on the wave of vertical legal integration. Now, my first question addressed to Lady Hale concerns uh, two very famous judges, uh, Lord Denning before the Court of Appeal in the 1970s, and more recently, Lord Bingham in the House of Lords, offered judicial pronouncements uh, on the utility of comparative reasoning, and the case being, what is the propensity today of the UK Supreme Court towards the citation of foreign case law, and would you say that this is a that this is rising in quantitative terms, and what factors may have actually prompted this increase? Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's lovely to be 
here even on a Friday afternoon uh, on a lovely sunny day. It's a lot warmer in Brussels than it is in London, I can tell you. Um, so is the citation of foreign case law rising? Yes, I think it is, although I haven't done a count. Um, I think there are probably two reasons for this. One of which is that the lawyers who appear in front of us know we're going to be interested. So they do the work. And the other reason, which is the more important reason, is the nature of the cases that come before us. 20, 30 years ago, the House of Lords in its judicial capacity, which was the forerunner of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, dealt mainly in what we call big money cases, company law, commercial law, tax. And it didn't have much in the way of um, public law or human rights law. Now, a very large proportion of our work is public law or human rights or involved with international treaties, um, other than human rights treaties, such as uh, the Refugee Convention. Um, large number of cases have to do with that. Large number of cases have to do with European Union law. So one way or another, we have to look at foreign materials when we're dealing with that sort of issue. So it's the cases. It, the fact that the uh, House of Lords, the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords, became the UK Supreme Court, did that actually lead to some sort of fuel of empowerment by the Supreme Court itself, which would perhaps make it feel perhaps uh, more mentally disposed towards dialogue, greater dialogue? No, I don't think it's had any effect at all. Um, the, those of us who were in both institutions uh, would see a seamless transfer from... Uh, we, we have the same jurisdiction that the House of Lords had. Um, the changes that I've talked about in the nature of the cases had already happened before we moved. So I don't think that we feel any more expansive, outgoing, internationally minded than um, the House of Lords in the first years of this century, and when Lord Bingham, of course, was in charge. And uh, what is the extent of the comparative reference practicing in the UK uh, beyond Scotland and the United States and a few select countries of the Commonwealth? We don't regard Scotland as comparative. <laughs> We are the Supreme Court for Scotland, as well as England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So that's not comparative law, that's domestic law. Um, the, uh, the countries that we tend to look at, again, it depends on the subject matter. If it's human rights, we will look at those countries which have human rights instruments that are closest to our own, and our own, of course, is the European Convention on Human Rights, the rights contained in which are now rights in United Kingdom law. So we will look at Canada, because the Canadian Charter is pretty similar. We will look at New Zealand, because their Bill of Rights is not dissimilar. We will look at South Africa, again, because I mean, they have a more elaborate um, Bill of Rights, but nevertheless, it is based on similar principles. We might look at other Commonwealth countries, many of whose constitutions have Bills of Rights which are very similar to the European Convention. So on human rights issues, we would not on the whole look at the United States at all. We would regard them as very old-fashioned and um, not really dealing with the same sort of instrument that we're dealing with. On the other hand, if we're looking at an international treaty which has no supranational court to oversee its, or other body to oversee its implementation, the Refugee Convention is one of them, the various Hague Conventions, including the Child Abduction Convention, um, which come up quite frequently before us, we might very well look at US jurisprudence because what we're trying to do is interpret the treaty in the same way it ever other states party to it does. And we might even go outside the Anglo world 
but there are problems in doing that, which we'll come on to. Concerning a comparative constitutional law, I came across a, a quotation from Lord Justice Sedley that it has no practical value in constitutional adjudication and that it is mere judicial tourism, enjoyable and informative, but the artifacts which you bring back cannot be more than decorative. Can you say something about that? <laughs> well, I think it's a lovely phrase. <laughs> and, he, and he does have lots of lovely phrases, uh, and I'm a great admirer of uh, uh, Stephen Sedley's. Um, but I don't entirely agree. I think there are two fields in which uh, comparative constitutional law can be very helpful, at least. One of which is that in the United Kingdom, we are now increasingly a federation of three separate jurisdictions. Ever since we have had devolution of full lawmaking powers to the Scottish Parliament, to the very recently to the Welsh Assembly and to the Northern Ireland Assembly. So we do from time to time have questions about whether the legislation that they have passed is within the scope of their powers, within their competence. Now looking at other countries approaches to that kind of question can be helpful. Um, I mean the Scottish model is everything which is not reserved to the United Kingdom is devolved to Scotland. The Welsh model is the other way around. Everything which is not devolved to Wales is reserved to the United Kingdom. And those two models can be found in other places in the world and it's useful to look at how they approach them. So that's one area. The other area, of course, is human rights. Um, and emerging human rights standards all over the world are, I regard that as a constitutional issue. Maybe, maybe Sir Stephen didn't regard it as a constitutional issue. Um, but, but yes, other people's views on human rights are, of course, quite apart from the ones we have to pay attention to, <laughs> the Strasbourg ones. A very practical question uh, concerning you know, the, the skilled research support from within the different courts and uh, as judges, especially at the supreme level, increasingly rely on expert assistance in terms of identifying and researching law, a, a domain that was previously reserved to the judges themselves. So whatever their names, the legal assistant or law clerk or legal secretary or referendaire, you do have young law graduates who carry out very important um, tasks of documentation and research concerning comparative legal issues. And I just want to know how can you describe this in very tangible terms in the UK Supreme Courts? Hmm. Well, I would challenge your premise. Um, on the whole, in the common law world, the judges don't do research. We rely on the parties to do all the research that we need. And it is a very new phenomenon that we have any sort of research assistance in the courts. Um, I think the House of Lords began with four judicial assistants in about 2002, shortly after I, before I arrived. We now, in the um, Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, have seven and a half judicial assistants between the 12 of us. So we can't rely on them for a great deal of research. They do do something. If, if there's something we think the parties haven't adequately covered, well, we will ask them to do a little bit more research. The question then arises, do we share this with the parties and ask for their comments? That's a really difficult question of um, judges going off on frolics of their own uh, without having um, subjected the product of the frolic to uh, the party's observations. So we don't use them enormously. And when I go to the United States and I, I meet the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States, each of whom have about four law clerks, um, they find it amazing that we only have the seven and a half between the 12 of us. <laughs> and and can, Judge, can Judge Lemons talk about this in front of the European Court of Human Rights? Yeah, um, we have within the court a registry of about uh, 600 persons and 300 of them are lawyers. They're working on the cases and within the registry, there is a 
relatively small research division. And these are people who do uh, this sort of uh, research in certain cases, grand chamber cases in principle always, and sometimes also in chamber cases. And the, the, the way it goes, they prepare uh, the research, they, they send it out to the, the, the national lawyers, I would say, who are in the registry to check it, and then it comes also to the judges of these countries to see whether it is indeed more or less uh, according to national law. And it's all put together in a report that is in before the judges when they are deliberating on the case. And again, uh, just like you said, we have also discussed, should we make this public? Um, and until now, there's a very strict rule, no, this is only for internal purposes. Because, yeah, I explained it also this morning in the research group, it is not a research paper. So if you start to analyze this with criteria of academic research, there would be a lot of flaws. In it. So uh, we know that there are deficiencies, uh, but it still is useful for us, for the work, for us, uh, in our work as judges, it is, it is useful. And that's enough. It, related to that question about uh, the, the, the research support teams within the courts, uh, we do have today also uh, judicial associations, networking, and databases, and you have much more socializing today, and wherever you are, information is just a mouse click away, uh, and, and increasingly, uh, often in English, if any information on foreign law is accessible in another language than that legal system, it would typically be in English. At the same time, that when author writes, most often judges prefer to talk amongst themselves about anything other than their cases. And pragmatically speaking, the information exchanged or obtained in various meetings, networks, or associations is rarely of any use for national judicial decision making once back home. Now, how would you describe the impact of these networks and databases on the Supreme Court? Well, I think it's true that we do a lot more um, networking amongst judges within and without our jurisdiction. Were I not here today, I will be taking part in a joint meeting between the judges of England and Wales and the judges of the Republic of Ireland, to which the top judge in both Northern Ireland and Scotland is also taking part. That's what I would be doing, so a judicial networking. What we will be talking about will be issues of principle and process. We would not be talking about how to decide a particular case. And that is true even of the uh, Hague network, which has been established of uh, a liaison judge in each of the member states party to, in particular, the Hague Child Abduction Convention, which is a big thing in, in, in my country. Um, and they do liaise, but they liaise about general questions of law in and procedure in relation to the country. The one thing that they don't try and do is tell one another how to decide the case in front of them. So the quote is right to that extent. Yeah. Perhaps Judge Lennons? Yeah, I would like to say something about my previous experience as a judge in the Belgian Council of State, and there are some people who know that uh, also. There is an association of supreme administrative courts in Europe and a world association. Uh, as such, that association is one or two meetings a year, and only a few members of each court can attend these meetings. So. Uh, these meetings are maybe not so important, but they produce reports on, on, like you say, general issues, general themes. And what is more important in that association is that there is also a, a database where you can find judgments related to topics that are typically of interest in all of the member states of the European Union. And that can be helpful. Apart from that, I also think that it is very important to have more informal meetings between groups of judges like the one that you describe, or like, for instance, the Strasbourg Court and the Luxembourg Court, from, from my point of view, or our annual meeting in the beginning of the year, the opening of the judicial year in Strasbourg, where 
representatives of all of the Supreme Courts of Europe are together. It, it creates um, uh, some, some yeah, you, you establish context there, and the mere fact that they exist, they are very useful. Not necessarily concrete in a given case, but that you know, okay, these are the persons from that court. No, the court gets a face. That's very important. Uh, I'd like to speak for a few seconds about the, the effects of the Human Rights Act and, and the full incorporation of the European Convention and, and the case law of the Strasbourg Court into the reason of English courts. Uh, yesterday's UK, UK House of Lords and today's Supreme Court referred to, to, in a great number of cases, to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and with considerable detail. Would you, would you consider that the law and experience of other European states is coming uh, before the Supreme Court indirectly channeled through uh, the European Convention or the law of the EU? Yes. <laughs> okay, very straightforward answer. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, uh, we have been uh, members of the EU since 1972, um, so we, we obviously are familiar with the uh, interpretation of uh, EU law and when we have to make references uh, to the Luxembourg Court. Uh, we make very few references to the Luxembourg Court. Um, <laughs> I was being told yesterday that last year we made only 14, whereas Germany made 100, um, which is quite interesting. Um, now, that may be arrogance on our part. It may mean that maybe that we think we know how to interpret EU law, <laughs> or uh, it may be for some other reason, I know not. But um, obviously, EU law has within it all sorts of concepts and notions which are derived from the various, but particularly the founding members of the of the EU. Um, we learn about them through that. Um, the Strasbourg relationship is very different because it's um, much more recent. Uh, but on the other hand, when we have a human rights case, we have to look at the case law from Strasbourg. And of course, we tend to look at it as we would look at the at, at English case law. So we tend to look at all the cases and go through them and analyze them in great detail as we will with our own, which is not necessarily very useful because obviously your cases operate in a slightly different way. But that's why we do it. We're applying the common law method to the Strasbourg court's jurisprudence. Um, following recent conflicts between the UK and the European Court of Human Rights, most notably with respect to prisoners' voting rights, uh, there appears to be a genuine concern today that parliamentary sovereignty in Britain is being exported to what Lord Judge, former Lord Chief Justice, he retired in September, uh, calls a foreign court. And this resistance to vertical integration is not new. We have uh, different statements made, for example, by Lord Hoffman in the 1990s, but uh, today uh, this, this resistance seems to have spread somewhat. In November 2013, just a few months ago, uh, Lord Sumption, UK Supreme Court Justice, issued a broadside against Hasbro in a very noted speech that he gave in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, he, he warned uh, that the uh, actions of, of Strasbourg exceed its legitimate powers and undermine the democratic process. And Lord Justice Law, as a court of appeal judge, has called on the UK courts to stop deferring to Strasbourg. And in December, Lord Judge went furthest of all. He said, UK law must be changed to make clear that British courts are not obliged to implement the European Court of Human Rights' as judgments, emphasizing that Strasbourg is not superior to our Supreme Court. So can you explain, firstly, Lady Hale, the tussle over prisoners' rights, prisoners' voting rights, okay, and, and can both speakers give their views on Britain's attitude with uh, respect to uh, Strasbourg's activism? There it is. <laughs> well, there are two completely separate questions bound up in what you've uh, been describing. One is, what should the UK courts do with the Strasbourg jurisprudence, given that the rights in the Convention are rights in UK law, 
And the Human Rights Act tells us that we have to have regard to the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court. Um, it doesn't say that we have to follow it. It says we have to have regard to it. Uh, and so the courts had to work out what they were going to do about that. And there is an ongoing debate amongst us about quite what we do. But the one thing that we have generally done is to say that where there is a clear and constant line of Strasbourg jurisprudence, especially at grand chamber level, which would indicate that the complainant would win in Strasbourg, that's my gloss on it, but I think it's quite important. Well, then we will normally follow that line unless it conflicts with some really fundamental principle of UK law or indicates a misunderstanding of something about our processes and procedures. It's a very different question about what we should do if it is not clear that somebody would win in Strasbourg, to what extent do we develop the rights further than they have been interpreted in Strasbourg? That is an ongoing debate between us. The first principle is well understood, well established, and um, we applied it in the most recent case about prisoners voting. Uh, we said uh, we were uh, not going to say that the Strasbourg cases on prisoners voting were wrong and shouldn't be followed in the UK um, because we didn't think that they were in conflict with any fundamental uh, constitutional principle or that there'd been any misunderstanding of uh, our processes when Strasbourg had reached the conclusions that it did. So the prisoners won to that extent we did decline to make a declaration of incompatibility of UK law. And the reason I think that we declined to do that was that these were two murderers who were still in prison. And we could not envisage that any um, version of giving prisoners voting rights that would be enacted by the UK Parliament and would not be found wanting in Strasbourg, would give these two tow rags um, a, a, a right to vote. So we didn't give them a remedy because we thought they didn't deserve one. Uh, but we did, we did agree with Strasbourg. But of course the second question that you ask is the political one, um, about which I may say I don't think judges should be commenting too much. Um, if, if uh, I, I would say that the certain comments uh, of serving judges may have gone beyond what it is appropriate for a serving judge to say. But I won't identify which, but um, you can say it like once you've retired, so that's all right. Um, but one of the things about prisoners voting that amazes me, really, is why the politicians who have been elected under the current franchise think that they are uniquely qualified to decide what the franchise should be. Because obviously their democratic accountability is to the people who elected them. By definition, they have no accountability to the people who didn't and who were prevented from electing them. So I think it's a very good illustration of why we need human rights and why we need courts with the power to adjudicate on human rights because that is an issue where current democratic institutions or parliamentary institutions don't have the monopoly of working out what the right solution is. That is my, my current view anyway. But there are two separate questions about the democratic legitimacy and the, uh, what we do about Strasbourg. Judge Lemons. Yeah. Um, first, about the execution of judgments of the European Court in general, you refer to what the Human Rights Act states that the court has to, or the courts have to have regard to the case law of the European Court. 
and not necessarily follow it, I think that is a quite reasonable uh, way of looking at the things. Because um, in certain cases it's easy to give almost a, a, an immediate execution to a judgment of the European Court, but in other cases it's, it's much more difficult. Uh, Strasbourg deals only with the vertical relationship between one applicant, one party, and the state, the state authorities. But a lot of the cases that uh, come before the Strasbourg court originated from a civil a dispute where there are other parties involved. And of course, Strasbourg cannot say what should be done with the rights of the other party. So it has to be taken into account the fundamental rights of one of the parties, fundamental rights perhaps as interpreted by the European court, but certainly not disregard the, the, the rights and the interests of the other parties. Now, turning to the Hearst case, this should be in a way one uh, re pertaining to the easy category, because this is the vertical relationship between an individual and the state. There are no other uh, parties involved in that case. And I, I must say, I, I do not really understand why this judgment has given rise to such a big problem. Because what the Strasbourg court said was rather easy and simple, an absolute ban on voting rights for prisoners, that's going too far. Strasbourg did not say anything more. Did not say who should get voting rights who is in prison. It's a bit unfortunate that the claim in Strasbourg was brought by Mr. Hurst who was somebody who had murdered, and I think even twice or so, it's not the most sympathetic figure, and probably this is not the person who should take advantage of the judgment of the European Court. You should think more of people who have, I don't know what, uh, violated traffic uh, rules or something like that, and who happen to be for a certain time in prison. These are more the ones who will, uh, when, when the law is to be changed, be in the advantageous position. Um, so it's an unfortunate case to build a big, big dispute on between uh, the, the UK political system, political world, I would say, and um, the Strasbourg court. I do understand, of course, somewhat what are all the reasons behind it, but it, it, the, the case itself does not deserve all that. Now, when it comes to resistance uh, to the Strasbourg judgments, yeah, sometimes I also ask myself, where is the problem? Because I see that English courts, including the Supreme Court, that they sometimes go further than the European Court. It's not that it's always a big problem. Occasionally, occasionally a violation may be found uh, in Strasbourg. That, that, that can happen. It doesn't happen very much with the United Kingdom. But it can happen that there is somewhere a violation of the Convention. Um, but I also don't know whether the reason then is that it's because of Strasbourg activism. Um, having said all that, it is maybe possible that the European Court in Strasbourg has gone too far in a given case. It makes mistakes. Uh, but then we come to the topic of judicial dialogue. And I think that when Strasbourg has done something that is difficult to digest in the national, uh, in the 47 states, it is the responsibility, I think, of the Supreme Court to, to engage in a dialogue and, and to point to where we were wrong. And I think, and I want to say this very clearly for the record, I think with the UK Supreme Court that this dialogue goes very well. Thank you. Uh, concerning uh, hearsay, precisely, we, we, we have a decision of the Strasbourg Court in, in January 2009, fourth section in the cases of al Khawaja and Tahiri versus United Kingdom. And, and this case was, was, was very sharply criticized. Uh, the ruling uh, created quite a storm in Britain. And for many, it crystallized uh, much of what was wrong uh, with uh, Strasbourg, inflexible, ill-informed about the common law, and for all their talk of margins of appreciation and the like, insensitive to local expertise. And the UK Supreme Court in Horncastle, delivered in December 2009, tackled the issue of hearsay, uh, displayed a wealth of comparative reasoning, and sharply criticized 
precisely the Strasbourg. And, and subsequently, the Strasbourg court in its ground chamber formation came back to our collage and to Harry uh, shortly before Christmas in 2011, and the court was presided by uh, Judge Francois Stulkens. Again, we have a wealth of comparative reasoning. Uh, we, we, we have a uh, very, very detailed analysis, and the enduring importance of our collage and Tahiri may well lie in the short concurring opinion uh, of uh, Nicholas Bratza, the, the, the UK judge, in the course of which he remarked, and I quote, that the present case affords, to my mind, a good example of the judicial dialogue between national courts and the European Court on the application of the convention to which Lord Phillips and Horn Castle was uh, referring. Could, could, both, could both of you uh, elaborate on this uh, uh, from your respective positions? Do you want me to start? <laughs> This is the best, maybe the only example of a, it's not the only example, but it's the clearest example of a dialogue between the UK Supreme Court and Strasbourg. And of course it starts with a chamber decision, then there is Horncastle, in which we disagreed with the chamber decision and the purpose of doing so was partly to persuade the Grand Chamber to take the case in Strasbourg, and then, of course, to persuade the Grand Chamber to modify the view that the Chamber had taken, both of which happened. Uh, but Strasbourg's modification of the original position was, to my mind, a very clever and a very subtle one. Um, you don't on the whole say that previous decisions were wrong, which we are quite prepared to do with our own previous decisions. On the whole, you say, ah, oh, yes, but there are some modifications and developments which are necessary, and that's what you did. And I was entirely happy with the outcome of that. I thought it was a good example, as Nick Bratz has said, of uh, our pointing out, well, there are these problems with your chamber decision, uh, please modify it and a comparatively minor but nevertheless important modification took place. From my point of view, that was extremely beneficial. Yeah, I was not yet in the court there. I, I, I saw this, course, this uh, case from outside, but I fully agree this is uh, an excellent example of judicial dialogue. Of course, you need the circumstances. You, as you indicated, uh, there was the chamber case, chamber judgment at of the European Court. There was a case, a similar case pending within the Supreme Court, and there was also a request for a rehearing before the Grand Chamber. And the, the panel that decides whether or not to take the request and to send the case to the Grand Chamber was waiting for the judgment of the Supreme Court to see whether there was something new in it. And that is something that's exceptional. Usually the decision on whether or not to take a request for rehearing by the Grand Chamber uh, is, is it's a decision taken within, within weeks of the request. But here it took until the decision was taken in London and then the case was sent to the Grand Chamber. And as you said, I think the Grand Chamber paid uh, the utmost attention to uh, the, the reasoning of the Supreme Court. I, I would like to say that... Um, a judicial dialogue is only a real dialogue if it's a dialogue in good faith. Which means that the party that, that starts the dialogue, that, that disagrees with a, a judgment, should take the arguments of the other court serious, but also explain itself very well what its own arguments are. What is not a dialogue in good faith is simply saying, we disagree with your decision. And we maintain our case law. Yeah, that's that's not that's not enough. But this was also in this uh, from from this point of view uh, an excellent dialogue because the Supreme Court also explained to the European Court very clearly why the case law was not good and why it had to be changed. And I think uh, that that explains also why the Grand Chamber uh, was convinced that it had to change the case law. 
Now, this is, this is in a way not unique. Eh? There are other circumstances where the European Court or other cases, other examples, where the European Court has also taken into account later developments at the national level, but usually then years later and, and not in such an interplay as it was in this case. Uh, it can happen in, in various ways. Eh? Uh, this week, the European Court Grand Chamber handed down a judgment in which it declared a complaint against uh, Serbia inadmissible because in the meantime between the chamber judgment and the grand chamber judgment there had been a judgment of the Serbian constitutional court which had put the case in an entirely different light it's also a sort of a of a dialogue because we 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 referred very much to the constitutional court's judgment thank you we have a recent case, Animal Defenders International versus UK, and in this case, the Strasbourg Court ruled that the general ban on paid political advertising, understood in a broad sense on television and radio, fell within the ambits of the domestic margin of appreciation and did not breach the applicant's right to freedom of expression. And this was a very highly splintered decision, and one is tempted to make comparisons with the treatment of the issue in the United States, the case at Citizens United, of course. One aspect of this case is that the emphasis put on the margin of appreciation and the exacting review of the UK's ban, both by Parliament and the judiciary, may be seen by some as either a form of judicial dialogue, precisely listening to what national judges and authorities say, or has a form of, uh, has a form of cautious judicial politics uh, after the standoff in the prisoners' voting cases. Uh, would you generally consider that the case reveals an influence of the domestic judge's reasoning on the European Court of Human Rights? I think that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is this is a, a strange case. Huh? Uh, it was voted to, or was among the worst cases by the colleagues of the Ghent University in their uh, poll this uh, few weeks ago. Um, what, what happened in that case was, I don't think you should only compare it to the United States Supreme Court, but to a previous case of the European Court against Switzerland. That's right. VGT versus Switzerland, and in this case, the Animal Defenders International case versus the United Kingdom, the Grand Chamber went, went in a completely different way. Um, critics have said that's because it was the United Kingdom, and because you were in a, at that time in a difficult position, Brighton was looming, and you had to do something for the United Kingdom government. I, I don't think that uh, that, that was it. Um, but it's a fact that in this case, the European Court attached great importance to the margin of appreciation. I don't see this case so much as one of judicial dialogue. It's true that the British judges were involved, but the Grand Chamber referred, I think, even more than to the, the, the judicial examination, to the way the British Parliament had uh, examined the question before it had adopted its law. Um, it, it's a, it was a difficult issue, but the European Court could see that the Parliament had not adopted it without being aware of all the human rights implications. There were a lot of consultations, and the European Convention on Human Rights played a big role in the whole process leading to the adoption of the law. And taking that into account, the court said, well, okay, uh, there may be different ways to, to deal with the topic of uh, preserving the integrity of political speech on, on uh, radio and television, uh, the, the absolute ban of paid advertisements is in order to make sure that not only the wealthy uh, parties and enterprises and politicians can have access, but if, that, that, uh, you know, that no one has access. Uh, and the European Court said, in other countries, it, it can be done differently in in other countries, but um, we are we are satisfied with the way that it has been studied by the Parliament uh, of the United Kingdom, and it was confirmed then by the courts, uh, the High Court and the, the the House of Lords, I think, who also looked at the issue. Um, I think this is also a big example of the subsidiarity. Eh? It's it's a uh, if. There's a tendency that's undeniable in Strasbourg to look at the process, 
the process leading up to a decision, in this case more the parliamentary process, but the same is true for the judicial process, if that process is, is, is a, uh, if it shows that careful attention has been given to human rights and human rights concerns and preferably also the case law of the European Court as it exists at that moment, then there's a big chance that the European Court is not going to go too far in the issue anymore. And between brackets, uh, there is more care to look at what's happening in the European Court and, and what, what is in the European Convention in certain countries than in other countries. And that explains why we are sometimes more strict with respect to certain countries than with respect to others. The general rule is the same, but the application of the rule is different in the various countries. Thank you. I'm perhaps going back to, to, to Lord Sumption's speech in November. I, I facing the, 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 the global transnational profits, the, the, there exists a background of persistent skeptics who, who question the appropriateness and legitimacy uh, of, of transnational uh, judicial dialogue. They, they, they proceed in two camps. The soft camp basically includes those who think that comparative reasoning should never be employed by courts because judges always get it wrong anyway by reason of the constraints and obstacles to the use of foreign law, lack of resources, lack of precise information, out-of-date information, language barriers, and the impact of the socio-economic and political environment of the transmitting and receiving countries. And then you have the other camp, the hard camp, that argues that courts basically lack uh, constitutional legitimacy to engage in transnational uh, dialogue and, and that such practices is actually undemocratic. Uh, could you elaborate on, on these two uh, perspectives? As I don't share either of them, um, it's quite hard for me to elaborate. Um, I think that the problems um, relied upon by what you call the soft camp are very real problems. Um, the lack of resources, the difficulty of uh, locating what you do find out properly within the principles of the legal system in question. It's Actually, it's particularly dangerous between different common law countries. If we look at some taught cases in the United States, we may be misled because tort law is not identical in the United States, although it uses the same language. And so one can end up being um, uh, very wrong about things if one doesn't, isn't aware of that problem. Language barriers are particularly um, difficult. Um, most of us do not have much in the way of languages other than French and German. Probably between us, we have got French and German, uh, but we don't tend to have other languages, and so if it isn't in English, it's very difficult for us to look at it. So, um, so all of those are, are real problems, uh, but there are ways of confronting those problems. There are solutions to them. They're not, they're not objections of principle. Um, and frankly, the other, the hard camp thing, um, that's an objection to judges. You know, and whether judges are undemocratic. Judges are not, of course, undemocratic. Every democracy needs the rule of law. It needs an independent judiciary. And most democracies have written constitutions which require to be adjudicated upon. So the idea that judges are undemocratic is, as Lord Bingham said in a famous case of ours, obviously wrong. Uh, and so the question is, judges have to make up their minds. And sometimes the questions they have to make up their minds about are very difficult and we need as much help as we can get. We just have to be aware of the, of the difficulties of that. Um, I would like actually to agree with what Judge Lemons was saying about the Animal Defenders International. There was an element of judicial dialogue because we in the House of Lords when we upheld the ban did explain why we thought that it was all right despite the Swiss case, and indeed, of course, there was later a Norwegian case um, to the same effect. Um, but it's also the case that it was an example of Strasbourg being respectful of a recent democratic decision in the context of a qualified right. 
Um, and because Parliament, when it passed the uh, Communications Act, which contained the ban, did know that it was running into human rights difficulties, but it nevertheless looked at the arguments and decided that it would, it would take that risk. And another example of the same thing is the Hunting Act case. Um, you may be aware that um, there was some very controversial legislation in uh, the UK banning hunting certain wild animals with dogs. This was the most controversial piece of legislation throughout the Blair government. That tells you something about the Brits, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, the hunters on the one side and the anti-hunters on the other side. Um, and we had a case challenging the hunting ban as being contrary to, well, Article 8 because of freedom to express your personality. Um, Article 11, freedom of association, which was the one that seemed to some of us uh, might have some legs. Uh, and art Article 1 of the first protocol, uh, because there was interference with property rights involved in, in the ban. But we had various things. Uh, uh, and we said, no, this is something that Parliament has taken a lot of trouble to legislate for in pursuit of the great British project of protecting the welfare of animals. And Lord Bingham, who is the senior law lord, said, uh, there is truth in the accusation that the British care more about the welfare of their animals than they do about the welfare of their children. Um, and in fact, he went into considerable historical detail about that. Um, but when, so when the case went to Strasbourg, Strasbourg in fact held that it, it would allow that as being within the margin of appreciation of the local uh, legislature. Um, so it's another example of the same phenomenon. Uh, can you say something about uh, cherry picking? So the criteria for the selection of foreign materials, uh, we have different statements made, most notably by, by Sir Sidney Kentridge, a QC, writing his experience as a member of the South African Constitutional Court, that one cannot avoid some feeling of unease and using comparative materials for the freedom to select is virtually unfettered. And he further observes that there is an ever-present danger when the freedom exists to follow congenial authorities and reject inconvenient ones. So how does one go about uh, this, this issue of cherry-picking? And uh, isn't a court's reasoning weakened if it fails to consider evidence from another, from another apparently comparable jurisdiction whose experience is different? So what, what can be done about this? Well, I think the answer is yes uh, to the question. Um, if you haven't, if you have just cherry picked and you've only looked at the things that support the conclusion you're coming to, and you haven't looked at the things that don't support it, well, then I don't think that's very good judicial reasoning. Um, and the temptation to do so is quite considerable, obviously. Um, but. If, of course, what you're looking for, as indeed you're looking for in Strasbourg, which is a common European understanding of certain issues, well, then you're looking for what is the most um, common view taken in Europe of a particular problem, aren't you? Um, and uh, there may be some outliers who don't take that view, but there are, if it's the majority view or an overwhelming view, well, then you're likely to say that that represents uh, the, the understanding which should inform the interpretation of the convention. And I think we would take the same sort of a approach um, to that. Well, I hope we would, because I think that's the right approach. Yeah, there are of course two two sides to the, or the, the two sorts of answers to this question. On the one hand, it's I would say the research that you are doing, and that should not be selective. Right? You should try to look at uh, all the relevant uh, legal orders, and uh, it may well be that you do not find anything that is very useful in a number of states or so. Okay, it be so, but um, you you should try try to base your reasoning on 
on everything that is available and that is useful to you. For us, uh, it's important to find trends. It's not so important to be able to say in 30 countries it's like this, in 15 countries it's like that, because that is always disputable. But if we find trends, that can be helpful for us. Now, this is the first part to the, to the part of the answer. The second part is if you are then continuing with the draft of your judgment, you have first said this, these are the results of our analysis, then, of course, if you if the majority of the court knows in which direction it's going to go, it can support its arguments by referring in particular to judgments that support that point of view. And like saying, uh, this morning I, I mentioned the case where the, the court said, like the federal constitutional court has decided, uh, and then we take over that reasoning. There you do not have to say, and contra, a number of other judgments, uh, no, that, that, is, that is okay for the part of the reasoning, but it should be based on, on a fair analysis of what is available. Uh, just one last question before we, we, we turn to the audience. Uh, the ISMA uh, high-level conf conference on the future of the European Court of Human Rights in its final declaration invited the Committee of Ministers to reflect on the advisability of introducing a procedure allowing the highest national courts to request advisory opinions from the court concerning the interpretation and application of the convention that would help clarify the provisions of the convention in the court's case law, thus providing further guidance in order to assist state parties in avoiding future violations. Uh, I was wondering if both judges could take position on the utility of protocol number 16 adopted in Strasbourg uh, in October 2013. Perhaps Judge yeah. Um, I must say, I personally, I, I like this new system very much. With one problem that I will mention at the end. Uh, it creates a sort of institutionalized dialogue where the partners will be uh, the national supreme courts, big advantage that it will be the supreme courts, and the European courts. It's a system that prevents problems to arise because if there is a conflict, it can be solved beforehand. But it is less confrontational than the system where you have a binding judgment of the European Court. It's only an advisory opinion. And so immediately, the uh, requesting domestic court can take up the answer and, and give also an answer to the European Court in its own judgment. Um, I think the idea of such an advisory opinion is also good in the, in, in, for this reason, that the European Court will give an opinion on the interpretation of the Convention, but in such a system we will not have to get into the concrete facts, leaving that for the national courts. Now with the, the system of uh, complaints we have to get into the facts too because otherwise we cannot come to a conclusion, and we will have to do that maybe later in, in cases that have been brought first to us uh, through the advisory opinion procedure too. But in this case, it's good that uh, there's, there's a separation and that the European Court only looks at the general interpretation and that that application to the facts of the case is entirely left to the Supreme Court of the country concerned. So it's a very good uh, system. But there is one thing that is problematic. Um, the protocol says that the requests must be examined by the Grand Chamber of the European Court. Now, a Grand Chamber case before the European Court is, uh, is a case that, that mobilizes a lot of people and for a long period of time, I mean, if you count all the days that a number of judges are dealing with that case, uh, it, it's much more complicated and much more cumbersome than ordinary cases. So the Grand Chamber is not able to deal with all these requests. And it's therefore that the protocol also says that there will be a filtering. There will be a panel that will select requests that will be effectively put before the Grand Chamber. And that's going to be a problem because if we get a lot of requests, there will be a lot of simple rejections of the requests. And there I see a real problem because I can imagine that the Supreme Court of a country will have first have to decide are we going to request an opinion. 
Um, so, so I can imagine that the Supreme Court will have gone through a lot of deliberations before putting this request to the European Court, and it might then get simply a letter saying the filtering panel has decided not to consider your request. That is not going to be very favorable for entertaining a judicial dialogue, but I'm afraid it's going to happen. Well, it's not going to happen anytime soon, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, judging by the number of ratifications and, and, you don't and so on. I know you don't, but nevertheless, you haven't got very many yet, um, <laughs> which I think is, is what I'm getting at. Um, I think I'll have retired before we've, I've got to consider whether to do it. Um, from the point of view of a national Supreme Court wondering whether to do it, it will be very interesting how we compare that with whether we make references to Luxembourg. And obviously the references to Luxembourg, uh, the reply is binding on us. We do have to apply it. But it has the same benefit that Luxembourg simply interprets the EU law point and we apply. And so it's the same from that point of view. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we don't like making references to Luxembourg and we make very few. Um, and I suspect we would make very few to Strasbourg as well. But the situation in which I think we might want to do it is the situation where at the moment we are a little bit worried about what to do because we are very conscious of the fact that if we decide against the claimant, the claimant can always take the United Kingdom to Strasbourg. If we decide against the government, the government can't take us to Strasbourg. So if we have been too bold, um, we, we are conscious of, the, of that problem. And it's one of the reasons why we're quite cautious. Um, and yet there are, and there are some questions where we might want to go further than Strasbourg would ever go. But there are other questions where we would genuinely like to know what Strasbourg would do with it. Um, but you haven't had a case about it. At the moment, what we do is make our best guess about what you would do and then decide whether we like it or not and whether we're therefore going to... Um, uh, develop a bit or whether we're not. Um, so it would be quite handy in those cases where we're genuinely worried about whether we are going too far, I think. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll field a few questions from the uh, public for about 15, 20 minutes. Hello, good afternoon. So my name is Isabel Rouhi. I'm a law professor in another university of Brussels in the, in the ULB. And I would like first to really thank uh, Lady Justice Hill and Just Lemons for taking the time to address issues of transnational judicial dialogue on a very sunny, sunny Friday afternoon, even by Brussels standards. So I have a question to, for Lady Justice uh, Brenda Hill. You said that uh, in the UK, the situation of foreign case law is rising because the nature of cases has changed. And you said that over the last 10 to 15 years, the UK Supreme Court is dealing more and more with public law cases, so with human rights cases. And so therefore, you are looking at the instrument be behind the Council of Europe, such as South Africa, Canada, New Zealand. Uh, but we could say that the Supreme Court of the US has been dealing with human rights cases for a long time, um, and yet there is some reluctance from some justices to look at foreign cases, to refer to foreign cases, as we have seen in cases such as Owens versus Texas, on the criminalization of homosexual relationships. So my question will be, how would you explain this major difference uh, between the two countries and the two courts? It's simply because they are better, maybe. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Uh, there is, of course, a big debate in the United States. So it's not that all of them take that view. It is that some of them take that view. Um, and it, undoubtedly, there is a view in the United States that the United States is different from everybody else better than everybody else, but certainly different. And it's therefore not appropriate 
to be looking at other people's experience. Even that view, held as it is by certain members of the Supreme Court, and even more by certain politicians, is a very limited view because when it comes to looking at international treaties of a different sort, they look at, they look at other jurisprudence all the time. So they do, just as I said, you know, if they're looking at the Hague Convention, they will very frequently look at UK cases on the Hague Child Abduction Convention. If they're looking at a trade um, agreement, um, at the Montreal Convention, um, you know, on air travel, uh, they would look at other people's jurisprudence too. So they're, they're not consistent. It's only really on, I think, the interpretation of the US Constitution when they can rightly say, you know, we were the first, or if not the first, one of the very first, uh, and uh, we've been around a long time, and we know how to interpret our own constitution, thank you very much. I, could, I can understand this point of view. I wouldn't share it myself, because I would have thought that when you're looking at something as old as that, it is quite a good idea to be saying, well, yes, but what's the rest of the world doing, the rest of the respectable world doing, in relation to a particular issue? Um, including campaign finance and freedom of speech, to take an obvious example. Um, so I think that's the reason. Questions? The first one is a bit a technical one, and I'm not very well... I have read the 16 protocol, but I'm not... I don't remember all the details, so perhaps I, uh, I'm wrong in a certain issue, but if I remember well, the idea was to reduce the number of cases. And it puzzles me how we we create a new mechanism where we hear we could have now cases that did not come before Strasbourg. Coming before Strasbourg, how, how, why we think that that is going to solve the problem of uh, the European Court, which has a huge backlog, why do we create a new mechanism at a time when we just need a mechanism to reduce the cases, to deal with the backlog? Uh, and but the second issue there is you mix up, we are creating a, a mismatch, you have an advisory uh, opinion and you have a strong jurisdiction, so you, you could be saying, well, why do you need those two functions in one institution? I know such institutions at Belgian level, but uh, isn't this a danger that you get uh, some kind of client situation where some people sitting on the bench in the advisory opinion are also sitting on the bench in, in the similar uh, judicial opinion? So. Um, isn't that a problem? And is, is the European Court going to apply the client case law to itself? Um, that, that's the first question. And the second question is a bit, perhaps a bit more provocative, but uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm talking with my children, I'm having a dialogue. But in the end, I decide. You know? <laughs> well, they are six years old. Uh, perhaps later they're going to be, it's going to be the other way around. I don't know. But, um, but how is it working? How is it functioning in this dialogue? You can say, oh, we are having a dialogue in India, and all, all the ends are fine. But, you know, I, I think you've been very friendly both to each other, and I, I appreciate that. That's fantastic. But I can imagine situations where you pick two persons from the same bench, and uh, that it would not be that friendly. And, and then I'd like to ask, who in the end is going to have the final word, in your opinion? And that's, I think, bottom line, the, the essential was not adopted in order to reduce the backlog. There are other mechanisms. The only positive effect in, in that sense could be that it could prevent complaints coming to the Strasbourg court, but, but this is not going to be in great numbers. The, the idea behind the protologue is the dialogue, where uh, the, the drafters of the protocol thought that it would be good to avoid big conflicts between the national supreme courts and the European court and to have a mechanism where the conflict is avoided through a discussion. First a question by the supreme court, then an answer by the European court and again a reaction by the national supreme court and the possibility that later the European court has to review it again. So, so that's the only uh, reasoning behind it. It's an interesting question what you uh, asked about uh, the possibility that the same judges sitting in the Grand Chamber to give an opinion uh, later on might have to sit in the Grand Chamber uh, to decide on the complaint. 
<laughs> I haven't thought of that question. I, uh, I'm not going to improvise now, but there are always ways to solve it. There are 47 judges, so you can always constitute a bench of 17 judges who are completely different than those who were sitting uh, first for the advisory opinion. But I don't, I'm not even sure that it's a problem. Uh, I have to think about that. Just, just following on a, a bit, you, you caught a certain skepticism from me about Protocol 16, um, and I think you can relate that to the general reluctance of common law judges to decide cases in the abstract. We don't decide cases as a matter of principle, we decide cases. Um, and we are always, as indeed Strasbourg is, in its normal um, way of going on, we are always deciding the principles in the context of the particular case in front of us and applying it to that case. And it's only the minimum principle which will answer that case, which is actually binding on later judges, a fact which a lot of British lawyers forget. But that is the case. So it's our tradition is we decide the big questions in the gaps between the little ones, but the real, the, the concrete cases. But as far as you know, who wins? Who's daddy? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very different question because I, I don't think that we regard Strasbourg as an appeal court from us, because it isn't. If a complainant fails with us and they decide they want to take it further, they take the United Kingdom to Strasbourg. Uh, and then it's up to the United Kingdom what the United Kingdom does if they lose there. Uh, it doesn't set aside our judgment. Our judgment is still our judgment and that still is binding in, in, in law and on the parties to the case. Uh, so I don't think we regard Strasbourg as daddy, really. Um, I think we regard ourselves as, as, as the people with the final say of what the answer to the case is, coming back to what I was saying about deciding cases. And then if something goes on between other people as a result of which UK law may have to be changed, or the UK government may have to pay a minute amount of damages to the person whose rights have been violated. Because Strasbourg's idea of damages is so... Um, limited compared with our idea of damages. But um, that is not something that is... We, we will, of course, be concerned if Strasbourg decides that we did something wrong and we will learn from what Strasbourg says. But we don't regard that in the same light that we would if, if Strasbourg were a genuine court of appeal and changing the result of the case. Yeah. Um. Yeah, from my point of view, I would like to add something to it. I, I, I think I can agree. Strasbourg Court is indeed not an appeals court. And it's not even, uh, as you, if you look at its uh, functions, it, it, it is not an appeals court because it does not hear the cases de novo. It only reviews. Unlike the Luxembourg Court, it cannot impose a uniform interpretation on all the 47 member states of the Council of Europe. Luxembourg can say, and this is what you have to do. We can only say, this is the minimum norm, and we can only review whether the national authorities have uh, respected that minimum norm, whether they stayed within their margin of appreciation, which leaves a lot of leeway to national political authorities and national courts. So, so you cannot say that Strasbourg is an appeals court. Um, I think that really national courts are very much part of the convention system because of the limited review of the European Court. It, it, you have to see it as a whole team. And that's why also for the European Court this collaboration with national courts is so important. We know that we, we, cannot, we cannot do anything with the support of the national courts. Support of national governments is something else, but national courts, we, we, we really need them. Um, and the last thing that I would like to say, it's, it's somewhat not exactly your question, but um, I don't know if you, uh, the Supreme Court can re-examine the facts 
you, you, no, you're also only examining the law and relying on the facts as they have been established. Well, that's the same here in Belgium with our Court of Cassation. And I know from contacts with my Belgian colleagues that that's a source of frustration because they, get, they have to review a judgment of the Court of Appeal, which looked at the facts and everything. They have to look at it simply through the lens of the law and they cannot do very much. And then they say the European court comes and afterwards is going to re-examine the facts and it says that something is wrong. We get all the blame while the national system does not allow us to set things straight. Again, that shows somewhat also that there is a whole relationship between all the courts over the, the, at the national level and the European court to come together to a result. Um, I saw also that in, in an area where we have found a few times that uh, the Belgian system was not compatible with the European Convention, that the Court of Cassation found a way to, to get out of it by saying, um, okay, these are the principles, this has all to be um, respected by national authorities and national courts have to pay attention to it. We cannot examine the facts, but we can check whether the Court of Appeal has done its work and has checked all these elements as to the facts and it annulled judgment of the Court of Appeal, not because it was maybe wrong, but because the Court of Appeal did not get into the factual issue. So there are ways to get around the problem also. Good afternoon. Um, I work as a legal advisor in the UK representation, although my questions now are more in my former capacity uh, as an advocate in the UK. And I just wanted, um, it's been very interesting hearing your side, but I wanted to present the viewpoint of an advocate when you argue a human rights case which is, especially when there's no case law in the UK, what do you do? So uh, it's much easier when you're making arguments to draw upon case law of other countries, otherwise you're just making raw arguments. So uh, someone raised the issue about cherry picking earlier, but hopefully the advocates before you will argue cases on both sides, so you can see the, juris see the um, comparative jurisdictions on both sides. And uh, we always found it really useful. So, for example, sometimes you have the identical issue, someone with motor neuron disease, should they have the right to die? That issue has come up in a number of countries, came up in Canada before it came in the UK. And you could draw upon all the arguments, both in the um, majority decision in, in Canada and the dissenting decision. So you actually had both sides of the argument in one judgment. And that was the Diane Pretty case in the UK. Um, likewise, um, smacking in schools, should we have corporate punishment in schools? That issue has been argued in exactly the same way in South Africa and in um, the UK. And uh, one thing I've noticed is that a lot of Commonwealth countries have modelled their legislation on the UK. So the company law in Australia is very similar to company law in the UK. And um, employment law in South Africa is similar to employment law in the UK. So often you find exactly the same statutory provision has been considered by the South African Constitutional Court, which is then considered in the UK. So the Saunders case, I think, had been considered in South Africa. Um, so from our point of view, it's very useful to draw upon all of that. And even American case law, I mean, it was difficult to draw upon American case law because the Constitution, American Constitution is differently um, drafted. But uh, we had one case, and this was when I was representing the UK government, about all that free speech in shopping centres. And someone had brought a case, Appleby case, in, in uh, the European Court about that. And uh, there's a whole strand of shopping centre free speech litigation in America, which the applicants would draw upon. So we had no choice but to go through all that case law and then explain why it didn't apply in this particular case. So from our point of view, it was all very useful. And I suppose my, my, my question at the end of that long rambling excursion is do you find that the advocates themselves come up with examples from case laws? It's not the judges choosing it themselves, it's the advocates making the arguments in front of them. Yes, uh, definitely. In fact, that's the point I was trying to make earlier. In the common law system, we don't expect the judges to do much research. Sometimes we do because the advocates have not done their job properly, but we basically expect the advocates to uh, research matters. And of course you're entirely right that if there isn't a lot of domestic case law, well, you're bound to go and look for something 
that might help you with the answer somewhere else. And an awful lot of it is going to be in those Commonwealth countries which not only have a legal system that's very like ours, and a lot of legislation that's very like ours, but they also have constitutional provisions that are very like uh, 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 bills of rights that are very like ours. So of course that's where you will you will go. And it's much harder as you were saying, to get stuff from the States is going to be much help to you in that particular context. Of course, we did leave an awful lot of terrible legislation behind in the uh, British Empire. Um, so uh, if you go to a Commonwealth country and you find something particularly objectionable in human rights terms, the odds are very strong that we're to blame. <laughs> because we imposed all sorts of terrible things on our colonies that we would never have dreamt, and dominions, that we would never have dreamt of having at home. Yeah, I was wondering, you, you talked about Protocol 16. Could you say a word about Protocol 15, which inserts the margin of appreciation doctrine and the principle of subsidiarity in the preamble of the Convention? Can, do you see this as a, an approval, basically, of the court's case law on the margin of appreciation, or do you see it rather as a sign of distrust, defiance towards the courts from the member states, the state party? If you put the question like that, I would say it is rather a sign of distrust, because otherwise it was not necessary to put it in the preamble. But the way it has been put in the preamble is is not bothering at all. It, it is exactly uh, corresponding to what the European Court itself said. The, the theory of subsidiarity and of the margin of appreciation is a theory of the European Court. But in this case, the symbolic uh, fact is that the states said this is now not only a matter of the European Court, we take it up, we are the master now of this theory, margin of appreciation and subsidiarity, and we want it to be put in the preamble. Fortunately, not in the operative provisions of the, of, of the convention, but in the preamble. Now, having said that, okay, we know that that's uh, the opinion of the states. We, we knew that already before it was in the preamble, that they wanted to insist much more on the margin of appreciation and subsidiarity. It doesn't bother the European Court. What we only would like to see is that if you speak of subsidiarity, that there is also a primary responsibility that is being taken up. And so we would like to insist more on the idea of a shared responsibility in which the national level has the primary responsibility and we the uh, subsidiary responsibility. But, yeah. Okay, it was not necessary for us to put it in the preamble. It's a political signal that some, or let's say all the member states of the Council of Europe thought that the European Court was going too far. Does it influence the case law of the European Court? Uh, that's for uh, those who examine the case law and criticize it to draw their conclusions. Question. Do you think that the dialogue between uh, judges will change when or if European Union will join the European Convention on Human Rights? Well, it's difficult to predict. Um, I'm not so sure that from the point of view of the European Court in Strasbourg that the accession of the European Union is going to be such a big or, or create such a big change. I'm, I'm not sure. It could well be, but for the moment we are not living under the impression oh, there's uh, something that's going to change completely our way of, of dealing with the cases or, or, or the, our existence or whatever. We are very calmly waiting what's going to come and we'll see what's going to happen. Um, we are already dealing with EU issues in our case law eh? uh, through what's happening at the domestic level. The EU accession will mean that we will have a more direct link with the Court of Justice. We will be looking more directly into the judgments of the Court of Justice itself and not indirectly via judgments of, of the national courts. Is that such a big difference? I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, and apart from that, we have already a very good informal dialogue with the Court of Justice in Luxembourg that might become a bit more intensive. I'm not so, I, I don't think, but I can imagine that. Um, 
all in all, I don't think it's going to have a really terrible effect on the existing judicial dialogue. It, it, the judicial dialogue is, in any event for us, much more important with the domestic courts because yeah, the Court of Justice has its own, is capable enough to do what it has to do. There are problems sometimes in countries with domestic courts. And, and there it's for us important to, to have a sort of a dialogue with. We had a, a very interesting conversation. The judges of the High Court of, of England and Wales and some from Ireland and Scotland with the UK judge in Luxembourg and the UK Advocate General in Luxembourg only yesterday. And one thing that they said that was quite striking was that the charter of the European Union has been a sea change in how the Luxembourg court operates and looks at human rights type issues. Because in the past, it tended to have to look to Strasbourg. Now it's got its own charter it's not looking to Strasbourg anything like as much as it used to, um, and is saying, well, this is our charter, this applies within, obviously, the areas of competence, and we own that, and we are going to interpret that, even though it's supposed to be interpreted consistently with Strasbourg. That's one of the things that they said, and I think that's a very interesting observation that may be worth keeping uh, an eye on. Um, Quite what, of course, the scope of the application of the Charter is, is a very controversial question, Luxembourg as well. You may have noticed, as a final comment, if you read the, a lot of the Luxembourg decisions, even though they are dealing with areas of law where there is actually a lot of foreign law, they don't often refer to it. So that if they're dealing with, for example, the Qualification Directive, um, on, on refugees. They are not as internationally minded outside the EU as we are. Uh, and that may be something that we're going to have to, <laughs> to take up with them. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your attention. I, I think we'll call it a day. And thank you very much to uh, Lady Hale and to Judge Lemons for sharing their thoughts with us. And uh, have a very pleasant weekend. Glorious weather is uh, ahead. Okay, thank you very much.